I think we can start the program now. Hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to, to Patsunga University College official YouTube channel. And thank you all for joining our awareness talk on gender equity, which is organized by the Women and Internal Complaints Committee of Patsunga University College. My name is Biral Mulswami from the Department of English and Secretary of the Women and Internal Complaints Committee. Now, before we start, uh, let me read out the program for tonight. We will begin our session with a short welcome speech from our respected principal, Professor H. Lelthanzara, after which we will hand over the time to our speaker, Mrs. Lelrin Sang Yinglawa. Her talk will be followed by an interactive session and our program will close with a vote of thanks from our vice principal, Dr. Lalbyak Sang Tsong Tu, who is also the chairman of the Women and Internal Complaints Committee. The committee is extremely grateful to our principal for his leadership, for his patronage of not just our committee, but all the cells and committees of the college and for his encouragement and enthusiasm. And tonight we see all of these reflected in how he has managed to grace our program in spite of his very tight and hectic schedule. So now it is my pleasure to invite our respected principal, Professor H. Lalthanzara, to deliver his welcome speech. Yes, thank you. And welcome. <clears throat> A very good evening to all of you. Our resource person, uh, Ms. Larin Sangi Yinglova, and the chairman of this uh, Women and Internal Complaints Committee and all members of the Women and Internal Committee, Internal Complaints Committee, all the students and dear participants of this meeting. A very good evening to all of you. And as we just had listened from our host, uh, PUC is having a good number of uh, committees, clubs and cells to achieve its goals towards uh, achieving excel in uh, education. Uh, we are trying our level best in different fields related to our academic activities. And also we take, we try our level best towards uh, the issue on gender equality. We have uh, good uh, teachers and also from the student side who are actively involved in uh, the, the previously called the women's cell. And also now we have a gender champion cell in the college. So in addition to this women and internal complaints committee, the grievance, grievances and redressal cell also take part in uh, collecting any grievances relating the gender issues in the campus or within the college. So, <clears throat> but as we all know, uh, we are not very much aware about what is exactly the gender equity. Equality may be uh, familiar to us, but equity it may be a dif little different thing. Uh, I hope our resource person will explain everything. I'm also not very clear about this issue, but uh, we all know the importance of this because the central government and as an institution, we all know that the NAC assessment and NIR ranking also, we need to fill up certain points regarding these issues. So therefore, 
tonight our program is a very very relevant and important program and i'm very happy to have our resource person mrs larin sang in lavat tonight as a resource person and i'm very thankful to our organizers the women and internet complaints committee for organizing this uh, very important program i hope it will be a very uh, fruitful and uh, grand success uh, of this uh, webinar awareness talk on this uh, gender equity i'm very thankful to all the participants who joined through the youtube as well as in the zoom platform uh, therefore <coughs> i wish uh, all the best to our students and also the committees in future and with that i conclude my speech thank you thank you all thank you sir for the wonderful speech your words of encouragement and for the best uh, for the good wishes thank you so much now before we invite her uh, let me give a short introduction to our speaker for the night mrs larin sang hinglawa is first of all not an entirely not entirely new to patsong university college she had worked as a guest lecturer in the department of english way back in 1994 and 1995 before most of you were even born but some of the senior teachers still remember her but that does not mean she is old and she is still quite young in fact and still very vibrant and energetic as you will see when we invite her Uh, she has been working at Government Zafiri Residential Science College for over twenty years, and is currently an associate professor in the Department of English. And she had also worked as a part-time lecturer at Mizoram Law College in the evening or night classes for twelve years. She had presented numerous papers. Now I'm not, I will not be able to cover all of them. Uh, she has served as resource persons to. so many events and had delivered lectures in seminars webinars finishing schools and other training programs and in national and international conferences within india not only within india but even abroad she has also published several papers and she has served as member of various boards of editors she has also edited books she had served as a member of board of examinations board of studies syllabus committees etc and she had been draft committee member of amendment of mizoram state higher education council of 2017 uh, she has served as jury member at district and state level declamation contests organized by nehru yuva kendra ministry of youth affairs and sports government of india and she has been a board member of certificate examinations and subject expert for mpsc among others uh, she is also i i need to mention this she is also a, men- a member of the women's cell of the all india federation of university and college teachers organizations i facto uh, currently she is also pursuing a, a doctoral degree and her topic is literature and law so without further ado i was not able to cover everything in fact uh, but that was just a few a few highlights so without further ado let me invite our resource person our speaker mrs nelrin sangi hinglova uh, good evening can you hear me i hope i can be heard okay respected principal professor h lalthun zara Vice Principal Dr. Lal Biak Sang Itong Tu, our host Mrs. V. Lal Mal Swami, other faculty members, and dear students, I am so fortunate uh, to be given this opportunity. I am grateful to the Women and Internal Complaints Committee, Patung University College, for giving me this opportunity to speak on gender equity, a topic which does not generally go down well with the male audience. <laughs> at the very outset i would like to make this plea to the fathers sons and brothers amongst us that your awareness of this topic is as important maybe even more important to achieve the formidable task of acquiring gender equity as mentioned by our host 
my association with Patsunga University College began way back in 1994 when I worked as a guest lecturer for about a year. And I have always harbored fond memories of the college. And tonight I feel privileged to, give this, to be given this opportunity to share whatever knowledge I have of the topic given to me for discussion. At present, I'm working on my thesis on the, way, uh, on the area of women, law and literature. So this topic is of great interest to me and I have learned a lot while preparing for this talk. Gender equity, as we know, is a vast topic and one could talk about the various aspects of the concept for days and days. Hence, my talk will give a general awareness of the topic after which I will narrow down to the legal perspective with a case study of the Mizo customary law, which will make, which will hopefully make our concept clearer. Without further ado, I will go ahead with my presentation. I will share my screen. I hope you can see the screen. Uh, it has not come on yet, but I think it paper. will. Okay, oh, one minute. Yes, it is visible now. Okay, from beginning. Okay, is it visible now? Yes, it is. Okay. I would like to begin my presentation with this quotation from the father of our nation. Uh, I should treat daughters and sons on a footing of perfect equality. I fail to see any reason for jubilation over the birth of a son, mourning over that of a daughter. Both are God's gift. They have an equal right to live and are equally necessary to keep the world going. This is a very moving quotation from Mahatma Gandhi. And it so also tells us that gender equity, the issue of gender equality is not something new. It has been ongoing for centuries and it is still ongoing and we are still learning more about it. As the principal has uh, rightly pointed out, there is a difference between equality and equity. And as a teacher for many years, teaching college students for, for 20, more than 20 years, I have this habit of simplifying things. And I hope that uh, the, the teachers, some teachers here might be expecting some theoretical presentations, but I'm very used to you know, simplifying things. So you might find my presentation a little simple because I want people to understand the basic idea, the basic difference between equality and equity. Equality means that each individual is given the same resources or the same opportunities. For instance, the ability to get ourselves educated, to work and so on and so forth. While equity recognizes that each person is different, he has different circumstances and is allocated the exact resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal income. I will try to explain gender equity in this manner. First of all, it means fairness. It implies fairness, which is different from equality. It implies equal treatment among uh, equals. Please mind this word, equal treatment among equals, because you find that if equal treatment is given to unequals, it does not lead to equality. I hope I got, uh, I hope you're getting this concept. Okay, if equal treatment of unequals is not equality. So in gender equity, we are not talking about equal treatment of all. People will get the access to the same opportunities. The process of giving resources and opportunities according to the need of individuals and existing differences. So what does equity mean? Equity recognizes the individual needs, the differences of individual, 
and does not meet out the same treatment, which is different for, from equality. It implies fairness of treatment for men and women according to their needs. It does not require that girls and boys or women and men be the same and that they be, that they be treated exactly alike. This is a quotation from the UNICEF. So first and foremost, equity recognizes the differences in people, the differences between genders, and it gives out opportunities to meet the differences. On the other hand, Gender equality means that women, men, and girls, and boys, they enjoy the same rights, resources, opportunities, and protections. It connotes sameness, which is different from fairness. It means treating everyone in the same way. Gender equality would mean treating everyone in the same way. It implies equality in all respects for all genders, male, female, are all are treated alike, that is gender equality. And there is an absence of special privilege. This picture, I had shared this picture, uh, I had downloaded this from the internet. And this picture, I believe, you know, tells us very clearly about what equality means and what equity means. You see, in the first picture, you have these three boys of different height. And they are given the same box of the same height. And you find that the third boy is not able to see what is going on. And that is equality, treat, treating everyone equally. Whereas in the next box, you have a perfect classic example of equity, where the box is provided according to their needs so that the outcome is the same for all. So this in simple terms means equity. So equity, equality means, you know, there's a very famous saying, which, which goes like this. It says equality means giving everyone a pair of shoes. I will repeat myself. Equality means giving everyone a pair of shoes, whereas equity means giving everyone a pair of shoes that fits, a pair of shoe that fits. So when we talk about equity, there is something that we need to keep in mind. We have to keep in mind that the female gender, the gender that we are talking about, okay, is, has not reached, has not even reached the starting line to the race. Okay? And so what equity tries to do is bring the weaker sex as we are normally called, as the female gender is normally known as, to bring, to bring the gender, the female gender, to the starting line so that they will be able to run the race fairly and equally. So this is uh, the difference between equity and equality. Now, when we talk about equality and equity or anything, uh, in that matter, uh, we understand, you know, the importance, the value of health when we become sick. So we also understand uh, the meaning of equality when we look at inequality. What does inequality mean? I think this will help us better understand. Okay, when we talk about inequality, gender inequality refer, uh, refers to the obvious you know, or hidden disparities amongst individuals based on the performance of gender. The difference may be obvious, may be seen, or they in that may not be seen, but there is a difference. And this problem in simple term is known as gender bias. Gender inequality in simple terms is known as gender bias, which in uh, which is simplified into gender stratification or making a difference, distinguishing between a boy and a girl. And we know for a fact that gender inequality in India is a crucial reality. It's a social reality. And India has been battling 
it has been a social issue in India for centuries. The reason I had quoted uh, Gandhi's speech, like I said before, is to show that this is a problem that was faced, that has been faced by the country for ages, and it is still ongoing. Now, um, uh, Amartya Sen, uh, most of you know him, he's the Nobel Prize winner. He had identified different kinds of uh, gender inequality. He had talked about, uh, so he had identified seven of them, but I've only highlighted a few. The first kind of gender inequality he had talked about is natality inequality. This is natality means at the time of birth. This kind of inequality is, uh, you know, the preference that is given for boys over girls at the time of birth. And this, I believe, even in our society, uh, it is still prevailing, even though uh, we are quite a liberal society and women have moved up a lot in the social ranking. But still, at the time of birth, we find that, uh, you know, uh, we have this preference for boys over girls. And we have a very famous saying that goes like, um, when a son is born, they say like, you have become a real father. You know, that kind of thing. And th this is not usually expressed when a girl is born. I'm sure you are aware of that. So this kind of, uh, even though we don't have this much stratification in our society at present, but we find that this happens in the main, in mainstream India. It's quite prevalent in mainstream India. So natal, natality inequality, even at the time of birth, you know, at the very time of birth, uh, preference is given for boys over girls. And this obviously leads to female infanticide or female feticide, you know, killing a girl child before birth or after birth. Then next is another kind of gender equal inequality that uh, has been identified is professional or employment inequality. You know, in terms of uh, employment as well as promotion in work and occupation, women often face greater handicap than men. The other day I had, uh, you know, I had joined um, a talk on gender equity, which was organized by your uh, college and the resource person had talked about how as a woman she had faced uh, you know some kind of problems that were not faced by his, her male counterparts you know it is still existing even among the educated so in terms of employment as well as promotion in work and occupation women face greater handicap than men then um the third kind that I have identified, and this is something that I'm going to talk at length about, is ownership inequality. In many societies, the ownership of property uh, can also be very unequal. Even basic assets such as homes and land may not be equally shared. Then there is something called household inequality. There are often enough basic inequalities in gender relations within the family or the household, which can take many different forms. For instance, for, uh, I, will, I would like to give an example in, for household inequality. You find that in most families, boys are encouraged to be tough and outgoing. You know, the, the public world is their domain, whereas girls are encouraged to be homebound and shy, you know? So this is the kind of household inequality that we are talking about. Then we also have a special opportunity inequality. Uh, even when there is relatively different, uh, different uh, relatively little difference in basic facilities like uh, schooling, the opportunities of higher education may be far fewer for young women than for young men. You know, you may have the, your primary school education for girls, even up to the high school level. But when it comes to higher education, we find that in mainstream, you know, India, especially in the rural areas, women find it difficult to 
pursue higher studies. So these are the basic kinds of you know, gender equality that one would find. Now let us take a look at uh, the Indian scenario. Okay, because uh, since this is a, a general awareness program, I believed that uh, you know, we, 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 it's important that we take a look at what is happening around us. You know, that we, I want to give the Indian scenario as well as the global scenario, because uh, I, I believe that the purpose of having this talk is to raise general awareness. So I've, I have brought in these uh, aspects in my presentation. Now the gender equal inequality in India is set to be rooted in the patriarchal setup and gender bias society. Indian society is predominantly patriarchal in nature and this contributes extensively to the secondary status of women. Indian women have been victims of deep rooted traditional oppression and socio-economic inequality in a male dominated society. Society, family, religion, law, legal system, media, cultural beliefs, practices, education, political system, and education, everything de define and reinforce gender inequalities. The reason for these inequalities can largely be attributed the, to the patriarchal social structure and the gender bias society. Traditional, secondly, traditional and cultural practices have imbibed a mindset which is oriented towards the male gender. Again, this is something that I'm going to go into uh, more details in the latter part of my presentation. So traditional and cultural practices, these are things, these are factors that have imbibed a mindset that is oriented towards the male gender. Then the patrilineal social structure makes man a, pre a precious gender that needs to be protected because our lineage, okay, goes through the male, okay? So they become, you know, a precious commodity, you can say, a commodity that needs to more protection than the, 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 than the female if we want the family line to go on because we trace our family through the male. And therefore, this social structure, the patrilineal structure, makes man a precious gender. And that, you know, uh, as an outcome, may, uh, brings about gender inequality. Then the burden of, you know, getting a, a daughter married results in aversion for a girl child. This is very interesting, especially in India, because um, uh, recently I have been watching, I don't know, most of you, some of you may have watched this uh, TED, TED talk show. Um, where, you know, um, Justice Laila Seth, the mother of uh, Vikram Seth, had talked about the evils of the dowry system and why it is so important to give the girl child her rightful inheritance. Okay. And, you know, here she cites an example. Uh, the, the Dowry Prohibition ha Act had come into existence way back in 1961. And Justice Leila Seth, as I said, who is the mother of Vikram Seth, a very famous novelist and writer, she, you know, she recalls her conversation with one of the Supreme Court judges who had recently, who had sold off her daughter, okay? And she had particularly asked him uh, if he had given dowry to the uh, to the you know the to the, the the groom and very sadly i believe the though the act had come into existence way back in 1961 30 years from when the act came into existence even the justice um, of the supreme court said he had to give dowry because he was afraid of the security and happiness. He was afraid 
for the, the life and security of his daughter. So this shows that, you know, even the enactment of important laws does not prevent gender violence. It does not pre prevent gender inequality. There is something more important than just enactment of laws. Um, this is a very famous uh, quotation again from uh, Dr. Justice A.S. Anand. She, he had said that the fight for gender equality is not a fight against men. Mark this. It's not a fight against men. It is a fight against traditions that have changed them, changed uh, women. A fight against attitudes that are ingrained in the society. It is a fight against a system, a fight against proverbial, proverbial Lakshman Rekha. Okay, you know, this, uh, this for proverbial Lakshman Rekha talks about a line that, that must not be crossed. We talk about, you know, uh, gender roles in the society where women, where the female are given specific roles and men are given specific roles and none is to cross that line. So this fight for gender equality is a fight against proverbial Lakshman Rekha. You, have, you may have heard about the glass ceiling, you know, the limit to which a woman is able to rise in society. The society has created, you know, its glass ceiling beyond which a woman cannot rise. So fight for gender equality is all that. It's not about a woman fighting against a man. It's about a woman fighting against a system that brings her down, that pulls her down from reaching, you know, uh, her ultimate, from reaching the skies, you know. So it's not a fight against men. So please, I, you know, I make this plea again to all the male audience that women are not fighting against men. They are only fighting against a tradition that has chained them. You know, they have, that has pulled them down from reaching their uh, potentials. So it's, it's a need of the hour for the men to rescue the women. It's, the it's, 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 it's time that the society rises to the occasion. The society must rise to the occasion. It must recognize and accept the fact that men and women are equal partners in life. They are individuals who have their own identity. This is a very, you know, a strong um, plea for gender equality. Um, we have talked about the Indian scenario. I just want to introduce um, the you know, global scenario also. The feminist movement, I'm sure most of us are aware, is, is it's a global movement, okay? Uh, it has been categorically you know, divided into three waves, you can say three movements. The first wave, it started uh, uh, in, in, in uh, Europe, the term is commonly used to refer to the 19th and 18th, early 20th century European and North American movement to gain voting rights. The women of the 19th century did not have voting rights. So they fought for rights such as the right to vote, the right to earn property, and the right to gain education. These were very basic rights. And the second wave happened in the late 1960s and in the early 1970s again in Europe and North America, to it raise consciousness about patriarchy. It, you know, it legalized abortions and birth control, and it vouched for you know, attain, attainment of equal rights in political and economic realms. What is most outstanding about the second wave is that the slogan, the personal is political, became the slogan of the movement. What does this mean? The personal problems, the, the, uh, the domestic problems, the issues 
that were, you know, um, that was centered in the homes, in the domestic, in the domain of the homes, has come out into the fore. It has come, it, it has become a, it has come out into the public domain. So this was something uh, significant for the feminist movement. The third wave saw the rejection of sexual binary, you know, uh, the, the social construct of male and female. We're not going to, uh, into depth about this. And uh, it, uh, it called for gender as a social construct and not a biological construct. It began in the 1990s and is still continuing. It was inspired by the black women who argued that the second wave feminism was based on white Western women. Now, the reason I'm bringing this into your awareness, and most of you are probably already aware of this, is that, you know, uh, I want to bring it into your knowledge that gender equity, the fight for gender equality is not a local problem, but it is a global problem. Okay, it's an issue that is faced by everyone around the globe. So that's why I'm introducing this to you. Now, in India, the women's movement, uh, you know, was put into force with the release of this book called, called Towards Equality Report on the Committee for Status of Women in India. Uh, this report gave a comprehensive reflection of the status of women in, 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 in independent India. And this report shows that in spite of constitutional and legal safeguards, women suffered in terms of education, health, work, and violence. You know, this report brought into focus the actual status of women. It showed that even after so many laws were enacted to safeguard women, a um, majority of the women were still suffering in terms of education, health, work, and violence. So this was a turning point, you can say. Now let us discuss some of the legal safeguards. Uh, before I discuss these legal safeguards, I have heard from conversations, you know, from conversations here and there that men and boys have been complaining that there are no safeguards for them, that uh, it's only the women who are given this safeguard, and that is not equality. It's true that it's not equality, but we ought to know that we are talking about equity. And equity means that you have to bring up those who have been oppressed, those who have not even reached the starting line to a level where they can compete fairly with the other gender, okay? So we, we cannot just take the, in, the meso society into context. We have advanced a lot as women, but we have to take into account, like I said, the entire you know, scenario, the entire Indian scenario, where we find that even after the enactment of so many laws, uh, gender violence, gender bias still takes place. Okay. Um, Justice Laila said, I, I'm going to keep quoting her because I, I was quite impressed with her talk. She had said that, you know, even the dowry system though it has not been displayed now, it is still existing. They are still giving. It's not being publicly displayed, but it is still existing. Now let us look into these legal safeguards for women to give us an awareness. How does the law protect women? Now in article, in the constitutional law, we find so many articles that make provisions to promote you know, uh, gender equality. Article 14 of the Indian constitution provides that the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the laws within the territory of India. In a very interesting case, uh, 
Supreme Court case uh, titled Mitu Bala versus Union of India. The, uh, the denial of appointment as a doctor in the Army Medical Corps of what the litigant was treated as on account of on account of pregnancy was treated as arbitrary and illegal. In this particular case, Mitu Bala had, you know, approached the uh, the court for being denied appointment as a doctor in the Army Medical Corps only because she was pregnant. And the Supreme Court gave a judgment that this act is arbitrary and illegal. Okay, this is one instance where the, you know, the law has stepped up in defense of women. And another leading case we find in uh, C.D. Mutham versus Union of India, the litigant, the service of the litigant was terminated because of marriage and pregnancy. And this action was held to be arbitrary and illegal by the court. So we find that uh, the Indian constitution, you know, has done as much as it can. And even the law in India has done as much as it can to protect uh, women. Article 15 provides that the state shall not discriminate on grounds of race, caste, sex, or place of birth. Article 15.3 empowers the state to make any special provision for women and children. Now, I want you to mark this, okay? Because you know that these articles that we are talking about are fundamental rights. And fundamental rights are rights that we can claim as rights, you know, that we can claim as, as our legal uh, right, okay? It's given to us. It's guaranteed by our constitution. And denial of these rights is a violation and it is considered unconstitutional. Okay. So Article 15.3 empowers the state to make special provision for women and children. This is one example of gender equity. Okay. In contrast to gender equality. The ability, the power, okay, the, the constitution empowers the state to make special provision for women and children because they know that they are the weaker and the, the, the you know, the, the gender that needs to be lifted up. Then um, Article 16.1 guarantees equality of opportunity for all citizens in matters relating to employment or appointment in any office under the state. I, ho I had already cited examples of how the Supreme Court had acted in defense of uh, female litigants in matters relating to employment or appointment. Then Article 39 provides that all citizens, men and women, have equal right to adequate means of livelihood. Then Article 42 provides for just and humane condition of work and maternity relief. So these are examples, some of the examples of how the constitution has stepped up to make special provision for women. Then uh, we talk about protection of women from domestic violence act, indecent representation of women prohibition act, Maternity Benefit Act, preconception and prenatal diagnostic uh, techniques, Equal Remuneration Act. These are some of the acts that have been uh, that has been enacted to protect uh, women. Now, I I don't know if uh, uh, you have gone through. I'm sure most of you have gone through the provisions of the National Education Policy 2020. And in section six, we have uh, this special provision for equitable and inclusive education, okay? The government has been doing its part. In 6.1, we find that education is a single, it's the single greatest tool to achieve 
social justice and equality. You know, the right to education, I, I want to expand on this part a little bit. The right to education used to be included in, as a directive principle, but it has been now included, brought under uh, the right to life and the, uh, liberty, okay, Article 21. It has been converted into a fundamental right because, you know, it is believed that education is important if you are to live a dignified life. You know, the, uh, our constitution, I, I, you know, while I, when I worked in the law college, um, I used to take the constitutional law. And every time I read the constitution of India, especially this portion, you know, the, our rights and duties and directive principles, I used to fall in love with our constitution because it wants so much to give to its citizens the dignified life. But how many years has gone by since our constitution came into existence, since we have adopted our constitution? And the question that we need to ask ourselves is that, are all the ideals that are embedded in our constitution, with, you know, in relation to equality, in relation to social justice, have all these, uh, you know, ideals been, been, have they materialized? This is the question that we need to ask. A very re relevant question that I would pose, that I would like to pose to you, is that has the constitution failed us? Or is it us who have failed the constitution? Have we failed in implementing the constitution? It, does the fault lie with the law? Or does the fault lie with us, with us who are implementing the law? This is a question that I would like to stay, that I would like uh, to stay in the back of your mind. Then again, um, the social and economic, uh, the NEP section uh, 6.2 identifies the socially and economically disadvantaged groups. And among them are the females. And for them, um, they have allotted, they have, you know, they have proposed to allot the gender inclusive fund to build nation's capacity to provide a quality and equitable education for all girls as well as transgender students. Okay, so the government, you know, um, has done, I'm not saying that it has done everything, but it has taken steps to, to bring about gender equity and gender equality. Um, like I said, and as I was introduced by the host, um, I am working on uh, women law and literature and a very important theory that is put forth by the theorist of the femin uh, is the feminist legal theory. The feminist legal theory examines how gender has mattered in the development of law and how men and women are differently affected by the power of law. The feminist jurisprudence, you know, jurisprudence means knowledge of law. The feminist jurisprudence is based on the belief that law has been fundamental in women's historical subordination. This is another question that I want to pose upon you. Okay, I want to, be, I want to set you thinking, all right? I'm not here to give black and white answers. All right, I want to set us thinking. I've already raised one question. The question that I've raised is that, has the law failed us? Has the constitution failed us? Or have we failed the constitution? The next question that I want to raise is, is the law responsible for bringing down women, for, for the historical subordination of women? Is the law responsible? That's why I want to bring in the Mizo customary law as a case study, okay? To, to, to help us understand this concept, whether law is, you know, responsible for women's subordination. Now, the feminist uh, legal theory explores, you know, it's, it's an exploration of women's subordination through the law. 
It studies the systematic natures of women's inequality. Gender inequality as a problem is produced through women's unequal treatment by the law. Okay. When I present a theory to you, it does not mean that I adhere to it. It doesn't mean that I oppose it also. Right? So I want to set us thinking. The feminist legal theorists believe that gender inequality is a problem brought by women's unequal treatment by the law. What they are saying is that the law itself is responsible for bringing about unequal treatment of women. Okay, So what is a woman to do at this point of time? The women's best attempt is to eradicate these legal barriers. I don't know if uh, this has been highlighted in the screen. I have tried to highlight it um, because I want you to keep this in mind again. Okay, The women's best attempt is to eradicate these legal barriers. A, re a very relevant question that have been raised by many scholars is whether the law is male. The question that has been posed many times is, is the law male? Okay. And why are they saying this? Why are they saying that the law is male? Because they believe, okay, scholars who adhere to this belief, they believe that uh, law systematically favors men and oppresses women. And they believe that law is male in that its principles apply to the public world. Now, if we go back to the gender equality that we have talked about, okay, how gender equality uh, arises when you know the, the, the boy is encouraged to go outside, to go out into the public domain, and the woman is encouraged to be homebound. So the most principles of law apply to the public world. So they believe that because of this, the law is male. Then they also believe that male law is systematically biased against women, that most lawmakers are women, I'm sorry, are men. And therefore, law is made, enacted from the perspective of men who do not understand women's perspective. Okay, so this is what they believe. Again, I'm repeating myself. I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, you know, expressing my personal views. These are views that are relevant. These are views that have been shared by people around the globe. So I need you to be aware of this. Okay, so male law is systematically biased against women. This is what they believe. Because male law fails to pray, pay attention to the vital issues of family. Okay, so you see the domain that is created by uh, the, the society where the male, again, as, as I said, is expected to be outside and the female is expected to be inside. And most principles of law apply to the public domain. And therefore, the law fails to pay attention to the vital issues of family. This is their argument, okay? I'm bringing these arguments, you know, these theories into your heads so that, you know, we can have uh, a good discussion later on also. Now, uh, we will proceed uh, to our case study. Okay, our case study of, uh, our case study of MISO customary law. But before that, I want to explain, you, most of you are probably aware of it, and most of you, some of you may know much more than I do, because I come from literature background, and people from other backgrounds may have better knowledge of this, but I'm trying to simplify this for all our sakes, okay? Custom, what is custom? A custom is a traditional and widely accepted way of behaving or doing something that is specific to a particular society, place, or time. Custom must be ancient and immemorial, immemorial so that it may be considered as a valid binding custom. Um, many people 
um, that I know have said that um, with the enactment of the Meso Marriage, Divorce and Inheritance of Property Act, the Meso customary law has been abolished. Okay, because custom as defined must be ancient and immemorial. Immemorial means you cannot tell what time, at what specific time that it came into force. Okay, it has started from long way back. There's no specific time. But the Meso Marriage, Divorce and Inheritance Act came into force in 2014. We can tell the time. It's no longer a customary law. Okay, once it has become, this is, uh, this is an argument, you know, that has been put forward by many lawyers. So I'm just, again, bringing it into your awareness. Now, what is a customary law? Out of custom comes the customary law. Okay, now the customary law is an essential part of tribal jurisprudence. Jurisprudence, like I said before, juris means law, prudence means knowledge. Okay, so knowledge in simple terms, it means uh, knowledge of law. It's a difficult paper, but I'm simplifying it for you. So jurisprudence is means knowledge of law. So customary law is an essential part of tribal, uh, our knowledge of law, our knowledge of tribal law, okay? It is an established social practice. It is an age old code of conduct, age old, okay? It has been practiced from many years. And what is more, uh, most astounding is that it is obligatory. Okay, it's almost compulsory because it has the sanction of the collective conscience of the society. What the society believes is right. What the society obligates, it, the, the customary law may not have been passed by a parliament. It may not have been passed by uh, a legislative assembly, but it has the sanction of the collective conscience of the society. What the society classifies as right or wrong becomes the customary law. Now, this takes us back to what Justice Leila said, had talked about when he, she, she talked about the dowry system, okay? The dowry system has this kind of, you know, sanction by the collective society the collective conscience of the society. It's the community that promotes it, okay? And because of that, even with the enactment of an important law against the dowry system, the, the, the system continues underhand. You know, it's, not, it's not displayed outwardly, but it still continues because there is an understanding, okay? There is an understanding among the society, right? And this, and this is why, this is one reason why, you know, uh, we cannot blame, this is one reason why we cannot blame the society, the Hindu society in particular, for uh, their preference for a male child. It's not so much that they have an aversion for a female child. It's because they are burdened with the social practice of dowry that, you know, they, 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 they prefer a, a male child from whom they can get the dowry. I remember my teacher back in Calcutta, you know, he had 10 daughters and he kept having children until he had finally the 12th, the 12th child was a son. Okay. He kept wanting to have children until he finally got a son. So the son becomes very precious in a society because the society has you know, followed a structure where um, it, it becomes a burden, it becomes a curse, you can say, to have a daughter, especially when you have so many daughters, how will you provide for, the dow for their dowry? Okay, it's not that, they, it's not that um, there is an aversion for a girl child, just like that. It's because of the system, again, 
all right? The social system that has brought this into existence. And it's a very sad uh, scenario. And the custom Mariro is a recognized source of law, right? The, they have the force of law. They may not be, uh, uh, they, they may not be um, enacted, like I said, in the parliament, they may not be passed as a law, but they are a recognized source of law within the jurisdiction of the civil law tradition. Now let's talk about the Miso customary law, okay? It is known as the Miso Namdan, okay? It was known as the Miso Namdan. And the earliest works on the Misos were written by the non Misos, the, the missionaries and the officers, and they were not written by historians. And the first attempt uh, or, or, or to record Miso custom, as you know, was made by N.E. Perry in 1928 in consultation with 56 chiefs at the time. And that it's titled, uh, the record was titled A Monograph on Lushai Customs and Ceremonies. Okay, we are aware of this. And, uh, you know, this, even this little uh, portion calls for a long discussion because we talk about uh, colonialism, how our story is told by uh, the, co the, the colonizers and not us. Okay. But uh, this particular monograph is said to be trustworthy because it was written in consultation with 56 chiefs of the time. So, the writers were not telling the, the story, our story from their perspective alone. It was done in consultation with the Mizos. Now, if you look at the Miso um, social structure again, uh, we are almost coming to the end of my presentation, my talk. If you look at the uh, social structure, again, it's patriarchal and patrilineal, okay? And um, women, no say in decision making in the home or in the public domain. This was in the past, okay? Um, it doesn't uh, really happen nowadays in most homes, right? But this was in the past. Women, we're talking, because we're talking about customary law, women had no say. This is an example, you know, of uh, the adage that crab meat is not counted as, as meat, as a woman's word, it's not counted as a word. The wisdom of women does not reach cross beyond the village pings. These are very well known. You know, they, they have been quoted again and again when lectures on equity and gender equality has, have been uh, delivered. So I will not get into this. Um, our case study, like I said, is going to be on our succession. Succession, because I want to bring this into our study to show us how. Uh, we have, you know, as meso society, uh, we have as as um, as uh, women, we have gone quite ahead in terms of education, right? In terms of job opportunity, if you go to the market, they say you you find all females. If you go to offices, you find mostly females. So we have, you know, gone a long way. But uh, when it comes to role, our succession. Uh, this is something that uh, this is something where we find that uh, there is gender inequality. Okay, now I want you to remember that um, particular um, line regarding uh, the, uh, regarding the feminist legal theory. What they had said was that. Uh, the, the women's best attempt is to eradicate these legal barriers, okay? How have women reacted to this? These are things that we're going to discuss because this is one area where we find there's no equality and this is one area where measures have been taken, measures have been taken to bring about gender uh, equity, okay? With particular reference to the Miso uh, succession Act, right? Now, in the Mizo Namdan, which was collected, okay, which was collected um, in verse uh, 176, okay, Tang um, Aibya, Ro is defined as in le lo sum le bai. I hope we all understood this, okay? 
our houses, our households, and our money, and all that. Okay. Now they identify three kinds: um, inherited from Tatu Tetangaro, acquired Totswa, and others. No other Tungaro Dang. Now, Tang or verse one seventy eight proclaims that the ownership the Rone to is the patriarch. Pa bear to Rone to Ani. Okay, since the Mazo society is patrilineal in nature, property belongs to the male heir or pa. Now, the reason, again, as I said, I'm bringing this as an example, is because there are theorists who believe that the law itself is responsible for women's subordination. Okay, and this is one instance where we find that uh, the law itself clearly provides that. Paber is the role need to, okay, in terms of uh, wealth, family wealth. Then in verse 91, it provides that children belong to the pa. Okay, the children are the ownership of the children belong to the father, pa ta anni, in case of divorce and separation. Um, I don't know if I want uh, if I would bring this. Um, illustration. I think I'll forego this because we are running out of time. Uh, this illustration has been included because, like I said, I'm working on women law and literature, and I'm bringing this illustration from the story by KC Lalvonga because we know for a fact that literature reflects our life, okay, Refle a reflection of our life. And we find that in his story, you know, we find uh, instances of how uh, property is directly, you know, uh, is inherited by the male line, right? Uh, Tangi, Tangi is the only child of her parents. And on the death of her parents, we find that her uncle, Lian Tsunga, inherits everything. Lian Tsunga was secretly thanking his lucky stars over the untimely demise of his brother for all the wealth was his to inherit. These are illustrations from literature, okay? Then Tangi, she gets a divorce. And upon her divorce, what does she go out with? She, she, was, she was, you know, uh, divorced by Ma. I'm Ma, Apasal Khanam Ma. And upon being divorced, what does, she, what does she inherit? What does she take out from her home? She only hoisted her meager, meager bundle atop her head. Okay, the only thing that she could take out from her household is that bundle of Puan, right? She has been working, her husband has been missing, she has been working at home, but the only thing on being divorced that she can take out is a bundle that is, you know, that can be hoisted upon her head. So these are illustrations which shows, you know, gender inequality in those period. Um, now, with, um, with the enactment of the Mizo, uh, okay, under the customary law, I'll just go into this again. Under the customary law, again, under verse 180, roll day two in the town. How the, you know, the property will come when, a, when the father dies interstate. Okay, this is important. When the father dies interstate means, interstate means when the father dies without making a will. Okay, will Om Khan. How does the uh, family property devolve? The sons are the legal heir, Fapati and Lalber. Okay, Fatlum, youngest son or sons who take care of the elder uh, of the elder brothers will get the in -pui. Okay, and if the son dies, his children will in inherit. It's only in the absence of other sons that a daughter can inherit. Okay, so this is again an example of gender inequality. Now there's a version. There's this is a very controversial um, provision, okay, which is again repeated in the Mizo Marriage, Divorce, and Inheritance Act. There's a condition under which a woman can inherit, okay. Paber, okay. But there's a condition, and that is hetiangatu le fati enkol te tu nu dik le nurin om. Nuzaom, let's want lak. Nuthiang lim, 
chase mo thiang lim chase ani chu tiang ani zo lo chuan chan lo eng ma ani thelo a wife can inherit the father's the 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 property provided there's a condition that she has to be main chaste okay so this is uh, again a pre, you know a precondition is set so that a wife can inherit so the the family property now people there are many people who have reacted against this they have said this is not fair now um like i said the we have seen that um, the customary law as it is the customary per se has been quite uh, biased towards the the male right and what have the women done what have women done we find that um, women associations and the magp and so on and so forth have been pushing for uh, a, a new act wherein they can inherit some of the property okay the family property so with this the miso marriage divorce and inheritance of property act came into existence it was enacted and under this the the father's property can be inherited on the death of the father the wife becomes the head of the family if she remains a chaste widow and looks after the welfare of her minor children there's a condition she has to remain a chaste widow okay and if the children we have become majors she needs to obtain no objection from the children to recognize her as the head of the family there are no conditions laid down for the father but for the mother to inherit the father's property certain conditions are laid down so there are there are many people who have criticized this who have you know reacted against this then uh another outcome of this uh, new act is that property will be inherited by the sons who are not indang and the wife of the and the head of the family of the in equal share youngest son will get one extra share provided he looks after members who are not indang and then there's a provision for an unmarried daughter who has been looking after her parents and siblings being the main bread earner will also get a share of the property equivalent to the sons and mother this is a new thing that has been brought about now on on division of property on divorce this is something again that has been introduced introduced by the miso marriage divorce and inheritance act the right of women on divorce on sumtwa okay if the woman leaves out of her own accord she has no right of acquired property acquired property means property that they acquire as husband and wife except her personal property but when a woman goes out on mark the right of women on mark her personal property will not be disturbed she it will remain intact and she will have a share of the acquired property not exceeding 25% okay if she is marked if she is you know uh, if she gets a divorce on grounds of adultery and deprivation of conjugal rights then konkasula mark okay uh, if if the husband brings in another wife at the time that the wife is divorced then she will get a share of about 50% okay not exceeding 50% and another major change that you find under this act is that the custody of children should be given with the child's interest in mind previously the children belong to the pa but at this with the enactment of this the custody of the children to, is to be given with the child's interest okay so the the woman is not always the innocent one may not always be the innocent one the the a husband in many cases you would find that the husband is more worthy of keeping the children so if it's in the child's interest the the children will belong to the father if it's in the child's interest the children will belong to the mother so this is a change that has come about after you know uh, uh after the the women groups have spoken out and this new 
uh, enactment has come into existence. Now we have come, uh, I have come towards to, to the end of my presentation. And these are questions that um, I have raised. Okay, these are questions that I have raised uh, for further discussion, maybe within this, uh, within this uh, webinar itself, or maybe later on also. Is the law responsible for gender inequality? We have looked into the various aspects, okay? We have looked into the customary law. We have looked into the constitutional law. We have talked about how dowry system, you know, continued in spite of the enactment of good laws, okay? But is the law responsible for gender inequality? This is one question that we need to ask ourselves. Then can the passing of laws change attitudes? Okay. Is the society responsible for gender inequality? And in many cases, you know, in many, many cases, you would find that it's not the men who are responsible for bringing about gender bias. It's women themselves who are responsible for bringing about you know, gender inequality, okay? So these are questions that we need to ask ourselves. And when we talk about this, uh, I, want to, I want to congratulate, I want to acknowledge this committee for, uh, you know, organizing this awareness program. Because for gender equity, in order to bring about gender equity, the first step that we need to take is bring about awareness, okay? And you know, again, just as Laila said, I talked about the four way, the four A's, okay? And the first A is bringing about awareness. The second A, right? The second A is uh, uh, assertion, okay, assertion. When you assert your right, you know you have your right, but the right, the law will not uh, be, it's, the law itself cannot have any impact unless you assert the law, unless you claim the law for yourself, unless you take it into your responsibility that this law needs to be enacted, okay? So assertion, is another important A in bringing about gender equity. Then the third thing is attitude. This is very important. Can the passing of laws change attitudes? Because we find that in, you know, uh, in awareness programs relating to gender, because even I am uh, the secretary of the women's cell in our college, I find that many of our students, the male students, you know, when we talk about uh, gender equity and gender equality, th these topics are a put off, you know, and being a chain and detani, because they have this pro preconceived ideas, they have these preconceived attitudes, which will not change, which will not accept. But we need to know, we need to understand that when we talk about gender equity, it's not about your daughter, your sister taking your share. It's about your daughter, your sister getting their legal share, okay? It's not about taking away your share. It's about giving them their rightful share, okay? And I'm sure as, you know, patak, that we are, that Mizo men are, we will not recline from giving our sisters, our wives, our mothers their rightful share. Okay? It's not, it's not, it's not that they're taking away your share. And we have to acknowledge them. All right? Then the last A that we need for bringing about gender equity is action. Okay? taking things into action. We cannot achieve anything unless 
are we, now we are aware of what gender equity means. Okay. The next step is that we assert our rights. The next step is that we change our attitude, and finally we take action. All right. It's not enough that we are aware unless we are able to take action. It's not enough just to know. We have to take action. But we cannot take action if we do not know anything. Okay, we, the, it has to start from awareness. And this is exactly what the cell is doing. And I want to applaud the cell for doing this. You know, bringing about awareness. Now that we are, are aware of it, let us assert our right. Okay, let us change our attitudes. Okay, it's not being, it's not being unfair. We have to be fair to bring equity. And then let us take necessary action to bring about gender equity. And I want to end my presentation with this plea from a daughter to her parents. This again is taken from let us say it's uh, just as let us say it's a uh, speech. And I have, you know, uh, made my own um, translation. I don't know, but I'm not very good at translating, but I hope uh, it makes some sense. Okay. I'm going to end my presentation with this little um, appeal. Okay. I hope you, you listen well. Father, why do you discriminate against me when I can be as good as my brother? Kapa ing bangin nge min kiyar shandi. Kaunaw pa ang alokling kanit he ilay Mother, nurture, nourish, and educate me. And you will see that I will not be a burden, but will control my own destiny. Kanu min tom seilyan la, min zirtiro, zirtir na min pero, itan purit kanilawanga, kamahuntu ka insiyam tezo ka. And you will not have, you will have nothing to fear when brother is not there. I will look after both of you in your old age. Ka una pa om la huna po, lao tu ini big to la wanga, kum upa ilaw ni huna po, ke en kol te yang se. I ask only to be treated equally, will you not there? En kol na in ang tia anitadil, in pengam do nem. So that I have the freedom to choose and the right to care and no longer be the prisoner of my own gender, unable to resist or retaliate against injustice. Oh, Father, give me a chance. Just give me a chance. Oh, mother, break the bonds of tradition and let me into the sunlight to dance, to dance, to dance. Kanu, nam dalin min puar na te tupel la. Ni eeng huaya lim takin min lam dirang se. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Erin Sangi. That was very interesting and very stimulating. I can see uh, how stimulated the students were from the lively debate and discussion that was going on in the YouTube chat section. And I actually take this as a very positive sign because uh, it, it shows that we are becoming more aware about these issues. And I think we're on the right track with this. And uh, also changes or actions may not happen immediately, but changes will come once we get the discussion going. So once again, I think uh, we are on the right track. And also I would like to comment, uh, comment uh, the awareness level of many of our students. I can see that in the chat section again. Uh, I'm also amazed by the level of their questions, the level of the questions that we have received from the students. Uh, so if our uh, resource person is ready, I will read out from those we have received. The first one is addressed to the resource person. How does Miss cope with the stereotype of radical feminist, which is a scapegoat, or when patriarchal men feel insecure with your presence or your work? <laughs> uh, 
I've also typed out uh, the same question in the chat box. Ma'am, I think you are still muted. Yes, I think you have become audible. Okay, okay. I'm. I guess. Um. Everyone, I guess, uh, you know, experience this uh, the presence of, uh, of patriarchal men. But um, I'm fortunate, you know. Personally, you're asking about my experience. Personally, I'm fortunate. Uh, I'm fortunate that I got into a household, you know, uh, where I was not uh, under any kind of uh, pressure from the patriarchal men. In fact, you know, uh, when I got married, I, I did not have my LLB degree. And my husband and my father-in-law uh, encouraged me to study law. And they encouraged me to further my education in law to get the master's degree. This is something that uh, you would not find in every household, okay? And um, my husband was just talking about it uh, uh, some hours back. Many, you know, many parents were telling my parents-in-law that if she's this educated, if she is this educated, she might look down on you, okay? <laughs> this is some of the, these are some of the comments that uh, one would get from the society. So fortunately at home, uh, I do not have to, uh, I do not have to cope with, with such, you know, uh, thing, uh, with such kind of attitude, right? Um, I don't know, even at work, in, even in the workplaces, um, like Ms. Luboi had said before, Ms. Malswami had said before, I'm the um, IQAC coordinator, and um, I get a lot of trust from my colleagues, right? And they do not make me feel secure as such, okay? They do not make me feel insecure, I'm sorry. They do not make me feel insecure. So maybe I'm not fit to answer this particular question because I have not really faced such a problem from the patriarchal men. Maybe they have been, uh, they were, you should ask this question to the men in my family, whether they feel insecure with my presence. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. And we might get a chance to do that also. <laughs> because the next question actually is a, a more legal based. Mm. Uh, I've heard that IPC uh, 375, mm. in IPC 375, Rape definition doesn't include men who are the victims. I've also heard feminist activists also work towards men's rights. Can you expand, Miss? That is the question. Okay, this is a very um, important question. And like, even at the beginning of my um, presentation, um, you know, I, I, we have received this kind of reaction from all corners. You know, we, we talk about uh, protection of women from domestic violence, and we have instances. We have instances where uh, men are victims of domestic violence, also. But the thing is, uh, can can a man be raped biologically? All right, this is a question I want to ask you back. Can a man be raped? Okay. Then, secondly, uh, uh. Another thing that I wish to ask you, another thing that I want to bring across is that, you know, law, enactment of law is for general good of the people, for general interest. You will find that some people will say that, that the law is biased towards women, that it favors women. But the law is not there to meet everyone's need, individual need. Law is not enacted to meet individual need. 
it is enacted to, uh, to cater to the general need of the public. Okay, so we find that in a society, the bias is maybe a, the larger chunk of the bias or the violence is against women. The male is hardly the victim. You may have male victims, but they don't they don't comprise of this of a significant portion. So there is really no need to protect them as such. You know, so the law addresses the general need, okay? The 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 need of the public of the of the greater chunk of the society. That's why I think that uh, it's not addressed so much for men, you know, for protection of men. That's my personal opinion, okay? I hope I'm answering your question. Yes, I think you did. Uh, another question mm. is, since positive masculinity could be just as harmful because it's imposing gendered expectations on men, should we abolish gendered expectations in general? Wait. Let me repeat the question. Positive, uh, since positive masculinity could be just as harmful because it's imposing gendered expectations on men, should we abolish gendered expectations in general? Okay. Um, I don't know. Um, these are con no, these concepts, these are concepts, um, like I said, there are many concepts, even in law, even in theory, where we can't just say, we, we can't just give a, a yes or no answer, you know, because these are uh, concepts which raise your level of understanding, which level, which raises your level of awareness of things. It's like asking, it's like asking whether we should abolish this uh, feminist theory altogether. Okay, because like I said, I, I may not adhere to certain, uh, I may not adhere to certain theories, but still, these theories or these uh, concepts are very useful in raising awareness, in questioning concepts. And I think to do away with them just because they are not useful would be something uneducating, you know? So I don't believe we should. It's a very, very interesting subject, I think. Uh, gendered expectations. Mm. All right, question. Another question that we have received is considering this is regarding uh, more about gender identities, I think. Mm. Considering we erase identities, would that make everyone equal? And if it did, would that lead to all the subcultures dying out? How important are subcultures in our society that is Mizoram today? Okay. Is it really uh, possible to erase our identities, first of all, okay? And then uh, we are not talking about, um, I believe that everyone will not ever be equal, okay? Everyone will never be equal. But what we are trying to do is that um, we are trying to raise the level of those who are so unequal, <laughs> you know, in society. We are trying to raise them. We are trying to raise them to a level uh, mm -hmm. uh, to which they can, you know, grow along with others, right? So the question of making everyone equal, I don't think um, that's possible personally. I don't know what others will think, but personally, uh, if we erase, is it number one, is it possible to erase identities first of all, okay? And then uh, is it possible to make everything, everyone equal? These are questions. As long as humans exist, all right, we will be creating our own identities. We will be creating our own, uh, you know, mark in the society in whatever field we have, and we cannot completely erase them. And, um, and if it did, would, would that lead to, okay, definitely. And how important are subcultures, subcultures 
identity in our Mizo society. It's important to identify, it's important that we give, uh, we acknowledge everyone, you know, all the subcultures in our society. You know, personally, um, I, I, I was the, uh, the other time, the other day also, I was talking to um, my friends, who, you know, victims of intermarriage, children who are victims of, uh, children who are born out of intermarriages. You know, they, 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 they lose, somehow they lose their identity. I have, you know, family members who are children of intermarriages. They feel that they are very measles, okay? They, they've, been, they've been brought up, they are born and brought up as measles. But then we identify them as someone, mm -hmm. then we identify them as someone who are not measles, right? And I have asked these people to, to come up with literatures of their own, to express how they feel so that, you know, they, their culture, you know, can be identified. We can identify them. And these subcultures, you know, they exist in different areas of our society. We should acknowledge them. They, they need to be acknowledged. And they are important, I believe. We cannot have a society, a homogeneous society. It's not possible. You know, we will have... Uh, heterogeneous society, we will have subcultures, we will have um, different cultures within our society itself. In, yes? All right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, there are still two more questions. I'm sure it must have been very tiring for you, but our students have been very forthcoming with their questions. So. I will uh, read out the next one. Uh, are women responsible for, uh, this is in response to your, uh, the mm. question you raised. Mm. Are women responsible for their plight? So women can also be enablers of patriarchal violence, mm. but sole perpetrators ang alak su adikte big lawang, prevailing condition, consciousness lamate nuances tiang bang su em niang atina. Okay, this, this is something that I wanted to, to, to express uh, and I had forgotten to you know, bring it to my presentation. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because I, I, I believe, like you said, that uh, there's no one factor. Okay, there are multifarious factors that are responsible for gender inequality, right? We have talked about how law itself is responsible for gender inequality, right? And we have talked about how society is also responsible and how women are also mm -hmm. responsible for their plight. And a woman alone, right, is not responsible because there are certain social uh, expectations, certain social expectations that she has to fulfill, mm -hmm. right? Because at the end of the day, uh, um, I, I, I saw this FB status, you know, of a, of a woman. She's a, a, she's, a, she's, a, she's a professor. And I saw her status and I saw her status on FB, which says, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, a woman's place is her kitchen. Okay. A woman's place is her kitchen at the end of the day. She goes out working, but at the end of the day, her place is the kitchen. It's because, see, the society has these expectations of us, all right? And even if I personally may want to rise, you know, rise above these expectations in order to conform to what the society calls of us, we, we tend to, you know, fall into line, all right? Unconsciously or consciously also. Therefore, it's not just so. That's why I'm bringing all those questions at the end of at the end of our of my presentation. I brought in all those questions because there's not one factor that is responsible for gender equity inequality. So many factors, multi factors, for you know, which are responsible for women's inequality, gender inequality. Thank you very much for, the, for, for responding so clearly. Now here's the last question. Uh, 
how are we to address the instances of domestic abuse or underreported sexual assaults on women, especially here in Mizoram? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, I hope you remember the four A's. Okay. I hope you remember the four A's. Number one is awareness. Okay. You may not know that many of our many of uh, uh, our victims may not be aware that there is an act such as the protection of women from domestic violence and that they are covered under that, right? So awareness is important for women to be protected, even, you know, for a woman to be safe within the, the four walls of her home, she needs to be aware. That's why, you know, we have uh, these legal authorities you know, giving out awareness programs. Awareness is important. Now, the, the problem with uh, domestic violence is that, you know, we, uh, I've talked to, uh, in the course of my research, I've talked to um, judges, you know, who are responsible for taking care of these um, uh, cases. I've heard from them that in most cases of domestic violence, you, you find that, you know, at the beginning, we find a woman, you know, submitting a complaint in, 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 at the police. Those aware of um, these protections, even for them, they they submit these, uh, they, they 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 submit these complaints. But since their problem is personal, it's a personal problem. Okay, domestic violence is a personal thing. So, by the time the case goes on, you know, by the time the case runs they've already forgiven each other. And, you know, they have reconciled. The husband and wife have reconciled. The family have reconciled. They have forgiven each other. So they cannot take the, uh, the, the act ahead. They cannot take the case ahead because of this. Right? Mm -hmm. so, this so, so this particular, uh, regarding this domestic, protection of domestic violence, this is a, since it's a very domestic act, it's a domestic law, these are the problems that are faced even at the court level, right? They cannot take the case forward because of that. Now, the, the next A, uh, the first A is awareness. The next A is assertion. So a woman asserts her, right? But again, this is where you have an interplay again of other factors. You put yourself in the, in, in, in the situation, uh, if you put yourself in a situation where you have been violated where you have suffered domestic violence. You know, for a woman to come out in the open that she has been suffering domestic violence from her husband, from other, other patriarch of the family, it's a matter of public shame, okay? It's a matter of public shame. So very, very often, even though they know that they have this right, even though that they know that they are protected under this right, they often fail to come out because they do they often fail to assert their right because they are afraid of public opinion, okay? They, you see, this is another problem uh, regarding domestic violence, right? Then another, for the, uh, the, the next A is um, attitude, right? This is exactly what uh, I'm talking about, the attitude. What kind of attitude do we have? Most meso women, Majority of Mizo women, I, 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 I believe, will not come out in the open and say that I have been, you know, I have been a victim of domestic violence. This would have been different in the Western world. They are more open. Their society is more open, right? They come out in the public. They are not afraid to bring into the fore. And it happens that not some <coughs> religious men are also known to be violent. And to bring that person into shame is something that a, religi a, a religious wife will not do also. You know? So there are so many other factors involved in you know, uh, bringing this act across. Then the last, again, is A. So the four A's are important in bringing forth uh, this, uh, you know, to, to, in bringing uh, into, uh, in bringing into what do I say? Um, oh. Action, or oh, yes, bringing into action the enactment of uh, of these acts. Okay. I think <laughs> have I answered your questions? questions? 
Have I answered your question? I don't know. I think you did, ma'am. Uh, that was actually a very hard question to address. In fact, because yeah, most of your questions have sub parts, you know. So <laughs> exactly, the, the, uh, I've I've just read them as they uh, they were posted in the comment section. So, uh, all right. Uh, I think uh, we have run out of time. So, uh, I would like to thank our speaker for the the very insightful uh, uh, presentation uh, for. Uh, addressing all the issues and all the queries and uh, for making everything so clear. In fact, I particularly loved the analogies that you used. Let me reiterate one. Uh, one. Uh, gender equality can be compared to uh, giving everyone a pair of shoes. Let me add the same of the same size, all right? So that will be gender equality, but gender equity means giving everyone a pair of shoes that fit because people uh, come with different shoe sizes. Therefore, uh, that is what gender equity is. So I, I, I want uh, all of our students to take that home. And uh, uh, I would like to, now I would like to invite our vice principal, Dr. Lalbyak Sangitong Tu, who is also the chairman of this committee to propose a vote of thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> now, I'm really glad that uh, we could organize this. And I especially thank the resource person, Mrs. Larin Sangi Hinlova, whom we call Masangi. And thank you for those very inspiring words and raising our um, awareness to a much higher level than it was before. And any time that you want uh, uh, to share your thoughts with us, the doors are always wide open. And we thank the principal, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Ishlal Tanzara for being with us uh, in spite of his busy schedule. And I also thank uh, the committee members of uh, the Women's Cell <clears throat> uh, for coming together and making this program a success. And also thank all the students who have participated. And we thank you for all your uh, inquiring minds. And you know, I, I hope that you have um, really um, <clears throat> enjoyed yourselves and that you have fully understood what this uh, program is all about. And last, uh, but not the least, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Lalram Wanasailo, uh, who's a techni uh, technician uh, for tonight and uh, for bringing uh, uh, the YouTube live stream possible for us. And I thank you, Dr. Lalram Wanasailo. And most of, uh, so I thank all of you who have attended this uh, program, um, especially the students for giving up your time in spite of the, uh, the looming uh, end semester exam coming up. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Biak Sang Song Tu. And with that, we have come to the end of our program tonight. Thank you all for making this a success.